Our next interview is with Lynn Respis. Uh, he and his wife, Tucker, have a successful business. Uh, I first met them when they were uh, up in the Boston area, uh, out in Northampton. And Lynn, why don't you just ramble on for a little while, talk a little bit about your early life, your family, your growing up, your education, uh, when you met your wife, your academic experiences, what possessed you to become a bookseller, and just talk a little bit about that. Okay. Um, uh, my dad was in the Navy, so I uh, moved around up and down the East Coast wherever there were submarine bases, which means Norfolk, Virginia, New London, Connecticut, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Key West, Florida. The only shore duty my father ever had was uh, as uh, head of the rec department in Key West when Harry Truman had his uh, little White House down there, so he took him out uh, deep sea fishing and so forth. Uh, North Carolina background, born there but never lived there uh, until I went to college at the University of North Carolina and uh, 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 went, went um, into the service after I uh, finished school there and uh, worked for a couple of years as a uh, sports editor for a small town daily newspaper in, Eastern, in the town where I was born, Washington, North Carolina and uh, found out that probably a life in journalism wasn't going to be what I needed, so went back to graduate school and uh, was uh, working on a, a master's degree in library science when I was uh, diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease. Uh, late stage, uh, they didn't give me a very good prognosis, uh, didn't uh, look too, uh, too good for me there for a while, but... Um, since I was uh, needed to stay in school to keep my health insurance, the folks at UNC were nice enough to let me start working on a master's degree in history at the same time that I was working on the degree in library science. So along the way, I took a course in administration of rare books from Paul Coda, who was head of special collections at UNC. Uh, there, This would have been about 1977, 78, somewhere along in there. Um, and one night in class, he brought up a stack of booksellers' catalogs. Um, and I'm not sure, I'd, I think I had been in a used bookshop before then, but it was to buy a paperback, a used paperback of something I wanted to read. I really was com didn't know anything about the antiquarian book trade at that point. And I was uh, pushing 30 by this time. Um, and, uh, of course, I immediately looked over in the right-hand column and saw prices attached to these things. He had brought them up to show us different ways that people describe books, uh, bibliographically and so forth. Um, so, uh, and one of the books I had read, bought and read recently was Thomas Pynchon's V, and there, here, I paid $10 for it new four or five years before that, and here somebody was asking $65 for it, and my copy was still sitting on the shelf, so I said, man, you mean I can make a quick 50 bucks? doing this, selling books like that. And uh, so I asked, went to Paul the next morning and asked uh, what this was all about. And so he opened up his cabinet there for all the booksellers' catalogs. He took me into the stacks and showed me the Z section, all the where the books about books were, pointed out uh, some of the old um, biographies and autobiographies of booksellers, Charlie Everett and uh, Rosenbach, the wonderful um, uh, Fleming uh, biography of Rosenbach, and so I spent most of the, re the rest of the semester learning about book selling, and, and while I was doing the uh, taking care of the courses and so forth too. Um, in the meantime, the uh, chemotherapy and radiation that I was going through uh, worked. And I was went into remission in uh, mid '78, and uh, so uh, just sort of. Uh, started traveling around the yard sales and thrift shops and there was a used book store in Chapel Hill run by Paul Smith who had had that store uh, I think since the 50s anyway and he also had a store where he and his wife went up to Provincetown in the Cape Cod during the summers and then they would go back to Chapel Hill uh, during the winters and so that was sort of the model the only model that, uh, that I had easily available to me anyway and uh, it so happened that um, their, uh, the next year uh, they went out of business and uh, I was still sort of spinning wheels about what I wanted to do I wasn't sure I really wanted to be a, a librarian and a friend of mine with whom I'd worked 
worked on the small newspaper in eastern North Carolina when I'd been a sports editor, called me one night and said he had gone on with a journalism career and had edited a, a number of uh, small town dailies and said he was at loose ends. And I said, well, would you be interested in opening a used bookstore? So he said, sure. So he came up the next week and he had a thousand dollars and we borrowed a thousand dollars from his cousin who was going to be a silent partner. And I put up all the books that I had had in reading courses in college and that I had sort of accumulated from the art sales and so forth. And my father helped us build some shelves and we put them up in a space there in Chapel Hill and announced that we were booksellers. Mm. And uh, so then we took us maybe three or four months to realize that at the amount of capital we had and the level we were working, this business wasn't going to support one person, yeah, much less true. two. So Tucker wrote him a check for a thousand dollars and uh, his cousin a check for a thousand dollars and we ended the business and we sort of went off from there. And that's 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 sort of the genesis of how it got started. Meanwhile, Tucker, uh, as I was working in graduate school, I held various jobs in the library and was uh, an assistant in the undergraduate library, and she was my boss. She was a circulation <laughs> librarian at the time, and um, so we got together at that point and, and were married in 1980. So you married the boss? Yeah, married my boss. <laughs> well, that's, that's, a, that's a new one. Uh, tell us a little bit about the various. You've had you've had residences in various places. You've had your your business spread around a little bit. Yep, we started and that we kept that store there in Chapel Hill that my partner and I had for two years, and uh, uh, I already knew that I wasn't going to do that anymore. One of the things I discovered or fairly early on, the light bulb went off when. Um, it seemed like people would come in and say, do you have chess books? And I'd say, yes, we have chess books. And I'd take them over and show them a couple of shelves of chess books. Nah, nothing there for me. So I started thinking, well, geez, how many chess books do I have to get before somebody's going to want chess books? And that's just an example. But I did notice that any time I went out, and of course, this is back in the days when we were using used book price index right. and this sort of things and, and what knowledge you're learning by the seat of the pants you went along. But I noticed that any time I had a, a, let's say, a good county history of North Carolina or something that I might have put 15 or $20 or 20 didn't stay on the shelf right. two days. Right. So I said, okay, how do I transition from finding these books that people want rather than just putting massive books up on shelves hoping that somebody's going to come by and find something to keep me paying the rent and so forth. So um, uh, basically we sold, had a, you know, a, a Dutch sale and, and sold the stuff that we had there in the store and I kept the better things and uh, we shared a space with um, Barbara and Dave Wentworth who are also ABA members yeah. um, in Brightleaf Square, a renovated tobacco warehouse over in, in Durham and we were there for uh, seven years until 1989 um, and we were at that time we were dealing almost exclusively in southern related material, especially North Carolina Civil War and hunting and fishing material, which I knew a little bit about from background growing up in um, various places, uh, hunting and fishing and so forth. So um, uh, we were tied down a little bit at that time, taking care of Tucker's grandmother, and we had both of us had always wanted to live by the water, and we both loved New England. So um, we found, uh, we started scouting around a little bit places up north and um, during those years when we had the shops in North Carolina, I sort of ran a, an import business. I'd get in the car and drive up to New England and take a loop around through scouting all the bookstores in uh, New Hampshire and, and Vermont and western Massachusetts and along the Hudson River. and. When, when the car was full after a couple of weeks, also usually tried to work in an auction out at, at Dick Lannan's in Northampton, Massachusetts. I'd go back home and get everything priced and put them on the shelves or do a catalog, and then after a few months, repeat and do the same thing. So we had already, we, we liked Northampton a lot. That really appealed to us, the five colleges out there and the kind of, you know, another academic uh, community with lots going on. Normally the kinds of things you only find in metropolitan areas, but without some of the hassles of right. New York and Boston and so forth. Um, but we'd also always liked, want, thought we would want to live near the ocean on the water. And um, we found Bristol, Rhode Island and fell in love with it and had a wonderful year there. Uh, the folks were nice, and uh, they had the, probably the best 
success with house calls ever. We had a, a lovely little shop on Main Street in Bristol and um, had a good time there, but we found out that Rhode Island really just wasn't for us. So the, um, we thought that the weather would be a bit more moderate there because the temperatures, the average temperatures during the year were a bit higher than they were in Northampton, but we hadn't counted on the winds coming in off the, off the bay. And it, boy, it was brutal in uh, uh, November and December. So we pretty quickly made plans to live through our lease on the house that we had rented in our, in our shop space and, uh, and moved up to Northampton where we had uh, four really wonderful years from 89 to 93. And uh, um, at that point, we were really growing the business and, and doing pretty well, doing book fairs and so forth. By this time, I'd become a member of ABAA. Um, we did that while we were still in North Carolina in 1986. And um, my parents started... Going down. Getting some age on them, yeah. And we realized after a couple of emergency trips back home that we needed to head back uh, to, to, so we could take care of their problems. But we didn't want to go all the way back to North Carolina because um, our business by that time was really pretty much focused on at least from the middle Atlantic up to New England. So we chose Charlottesville, Virginia, another academic community with a good uh, research library there that, that we need to for the kinds of things we sell and and so we moved back and goodness knows it's stretched into 15 years that we've yeah, lived there it's a beautiful you know, town. yeah yeah it is a, a lovely town and we've um, uh, got friends there and had a good time but we're uh, we're now ready to move back to to New England here in 2009 my father just passed away and he was my mother passed away last year and so the uh, sort of our the the hold on us is is taken off now, so we hope to be back up in New England. You're thinking about going back to Northampton, a couple of years back to Northampton, or at least back to the Valley. Yeah. Um, and we, we joke now we're probably ready for a continuing care community or, or something, <laughs> fine to to uh, buy an apartment so that when we have problems, we can just move over to assisted living or or whatever. As we we now have some some years on us. Yeah. yeah well, most of us do. Talk a little bit about. Uh, you, your company, and the internet. Do you see the internet as a friend or a foe, neither or both? Yeah, I, um, even though Tucker and I, we're not Luddites, but it takes us a while because of the way we run our business to really become accustomed to some of the new things that come along. And one of the, our friends know that we, when everybody was buying fax machines, we bought a fax machine and it sat in its box <laughs> over in the corner for about three years before we ever hooked it up. And we, we've approached computers almost the same way. And even now we don't have a website. We don't have anything listed with any of the services. Uh, but uh, we're uh, inveterate users of the, of the internet. There's nothing like the, for um, in reference aids and so forth. I mean, I can't imagine working without it, and eventually we'll have a website and have things um, loaded. But we're, we're also lucky to have one of the wonderful things about this business is you uh, really make wonderful friends. It's, it's virtually impossible not to. And uh, early on, actually we were still in Northampton in the early 90s, uh, John Thompson of Bartleby's Books, and, um, and I started buying collections together, and, uh, and, and we work very, our businesses work very closely together. He and his wife have a beautiful shop in, um, in, uh, on M Street in Washington, D.C., in Georgetown, right behind the Four Seasons Hotel. They get, you know, some wonderful drop-ins for the moment, folks coming through, and uh, uh, we get along. We have similar personalities, and, you know, trust is always... Uh, the, most the, the most important thing and I think we both trust each other implicitly and, and it helps they have material on the internet they have a website we're still doing catalogs and if you were one of the biggest changes that the internet has come along is uh, every day at lunch when I sat down I'd always have a stack of three to a dozen catalogs that came in that morning that I'd try to go through in some fashion and now I hardly get that many in a week yeah. And we're still doing uh, a dozen a year, uh, and uh, mostly um, the fresh material. We haven't done a lot of retrospective catalogs from stock, which we did regularly in the early years of our business, um, particularly in specific subject areas. But um, uh, I view the Internet as, as an aid, and I'm not, you know, since we, we don't have as much experience with it as some people, I probably don't know 
um, just how good it can be or how bad it can be. And, and uh, not yet, anyway. Yeah, I don't. I've never bought or sold anything on eBay, but I have two wonderful scouts who know exactly the kinds of things I'm looking for, and they keep their eye out. And uh, whenever I go visit them, they've always got a couple of boxes of things that they bought, and um, I try to do as well by them as I can. And they're still buying for me, so I think they're pretty happy with with uh, doing it that way. And, um, it's I think sort of like the old way of doing things. That's right. Scouting. Yep. Uh, most people nowadays scout by going out to the internet yep. rather than going to see a physical yep. deal. And I used to world. consider myself a, a very good scout. Um, and I think I've lost a little bit of that, that touch that I used to have because there aren't as many places to, 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 to exercise it now. And well, when you move back to New England, there will be. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get back uh, going around now. But one of the other things about that is we're, we're, uh, we tend to stay overloaded, though, too. Scouting isn't as important as it was. You always like to be able to go out and find that, that one sure. good thing uh, for sure. But uh, John and I both have 25 or 30 years' experience in the business now, so we get lots of calls uh, referrals from our wonderful colleagues of when libraries come up that people think we're going to be interested in or collections and um, uh, we've, and the other scouts that I mentioned before so we've, we've got fresh material coming in regularly so I have no complaints about that and and I can't see I know a lot of people complain about you know the, the internet has taken away some of their business and of course we're in the middle right now we've officially been in a recession now for about 15 or 16 months, and a lot of people are seeing drop-offs in business because of that at a dual point, but we're, we're still plugging along and seem to be doing okay. What percentage of your business is with privates and what percentage is with um, institutions? Going back to the way I started business, I found out early, for better or worse, it seemed to me that the, the people who were easiest to sell books to were other booksellers. And I've always tried to, uh, and when I was a scout, I was all scouting with my colleagues in mind and hoping when I found something good, I tried to price it so that, you know, I probably wasn't giving it away. And a lot of people were, would probably tell you that I was gouging them or whatever. But uh, nonetheless, that was, uh, it was always pretty successful. And I still sell uh, probably, you know, by, not by the number of items we sell, but by money still um, primarily selling to the trade. And I joke that I'm still, uh, you know, sort of a, a scout for the trade in, in some fashion, but it, it's reality as well. And um, neither Tucker nor I is very good at retail. Um, I couldn't sell anything. Uh -huh. you know, I can buy stuff, I can price it, and then if somebody wants to buy it, then I can write up a ticket for them. But I, I'm just not very, I don't have retail skills when it comes down to it. Um, but the big change in our business, Mike, to be honest with you, over the, and that has been ongoing for 15 years, is our institutional sales. As we've, the more experience we've had, the longer we've been in business, the more people we've met, the more special collections librarians and folks. So now um, that's, you know, the, our, we still sell uh, probably by money, mostly to the trade, but um, most of the rest is now is to institutions. We have um, our um, private customers, uh, uh, we have great private customers, and um, they're friends we visit in their homes, and we love to look at their libraries and so forth, but uh, not enough to keep our business going. And, yeah. and of course, another problem with the econ uh, economics we've got right now is that we know that all of those wonderful endowments are, uh, you know, a lot of the money is gone, and certainly the interest coming back is yeah. less than it was. So there's going to be a, less of that, at least for the foreseeable future, I guess. What do you see as some of the challenges uh, for booksellers as we go forward? Well, I think um, in some ways I'm glad I'm not a young person coming into the trade now. I think that's a, a really is a big, big challenge. I don't think I think it'd be very difficult to start off in the trade. Uh, the way I did. I'm not sure it's a good idea to start up in the trade the, the way I did for starters. I mean, I, I'm you know, proud that basically I just started with nothing and built the business to where it is now, but nonetheless, I think probably if um, I would have been better off if I'd gotten a job with a, an established bookseller and learned the ropes. It would have been I, I would have uh, done in runs around a lot of problems that took me a while to, to work out. And I think for younger booksellers, um, 
uh, you know, there are only so many businesses. I mean, most of the most um, antiquarian book businesses are driven by an individual, and they, it all has the personality of individual. And right. uh, luckily, we do have some um, some businesses like the Bowmans and Jim Cummins and Bill Reese and other people who can hire folks and give younger people a chance. And, and I think it's wonderful. I know you go back to the I didn't know Warren Howe in San Francisco, but now a lot of the booksellers my age or even a little older got their start. Um, right. You know, working with him and, and other places too. I know, so I know that's one big problem. And I think um, uh, capital is always a problem. This, you know, so you can only you, uh, this is a, a capital intensive business, and you can only move along at the rate that you can turn things over and, and uh, have enough bonnet money to buy the next good book or the next good collection, or or whatever. And I think the um, um, I'm, I think the you the, uh, I still. Um, sell scholarly books and mm -hmm. I think that's tough and I think it's going to be um, the internet is is the greatest place in the world if you're looking for a specific book by a specific author that was published here boy just pull up um, at all or via Libri or something and you probably have a half a dozen or or, or a hundred different copies to look at to decide which one suits you by price or condition or, or whatever and I know my friends who are now still running uh, old used bookshops, uh, old, you know, um, scholarly books and readers' books and so forth are really having a tough time mm -hmm. because people are using the internet uh, for that so much. But as my business has gone on over the years, we're now selling things that I, I call sort of things that got, somehow fell through the cracks. Um, uh, manuscripts, autographs, photographs, collections of manuscripts and photographs, broadsides, privately printed things, uh, ephemera, uh, of all kinds that somehow institutions missed along the way that they really need to sort of fill out their collections. And um, so we're you know, sort of moving away, leaving the, the, the scholarly book behind, even though we still have not probably always have some, yeah. but, and moving more into the kinds of things that once you've got it, it's, a, it's pretty much a unique item, and then it's just a matter of finding somebody who needs it or wants it. Talk a little bit about the... Um the trade as a trade. Uh, there are many of us who are over 60 who are the sort of stalwarts of the trade and the ABAA, and many of us do not see a group coming in to take our place. We wonder whether there'll be an ABAA or an ILAB as time goes on. What's your feeling? Well, I'm, I, again, I'm not, I don't think I'm, I've really got my finger on that pulse either in some ways because by the, by the time I became a member of ABAA in 19, 86, I think it was. Um, there had always been that. There had already been that big growth in the yeah. 60s or 70s, where it had gone from 100 or so members up to. By the time I became a member, there were 450 members, yeah. and so I've been a member now for 20, over 20 years, 23 years, and the membership is about the same number and has been virtually that whole time. And you know, you know it, I think it has gone up, approaching. 500 a couple of times and dropped down, down. A, a few times under the under the 450. But basically, it's been in that 450 to 475 range the whole time I've been um, uh, in the trade. I came in in a, a big group of people who were in their um, early 30s, early to mid 30s, right. and we're now. I'm 61 now, and, and uh, you know, so the group of people who are let's say 58 to 65. I know is large, but I have no, I have no idea how exactly how many is. But I still look at the people. I say, well, there are no uh, younger people coming in, and um, uh, you know, there are younger people coming in. As, you know, I know it's a matter of are there enough, but you know, uh, uh, Jeff Hirsch and Harper Levine and Mike, you know, Mike Benson is older, but he's still 50. You know, and they're always sort of I, I consider a young bookseller sort of mid 30s to 50, yeah. because most 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 people in our trade. Uh, already, um, you know, have, had done something else, or it just takes a while to build up some money to get the knowledge. There were collectors, there were lawyers who didn't really like being lawyers. Right. You know, there's, there's many <laughs> different things, basically, as there are of us. And there aren't very many people who come, graduate from college, they're 22 years old, and become an antiquarian bookseller. That just, I don't think that's really ever happened very much. There are exceptions. You know, Bill Reese and Owen Kubik and other people like that certainly have, and, and I know there are other great examples, but um, 
Uh, I know we've got two, uh, two more younger booksellers in their mid-30s who are about to apply for membership from the South. And uh, you know, I don't know how many there are under 50 in the association right now, but I would bet there are probably 50, 50 or so. So I don't know whether, whether that's good or bad, but uh, uh, I think the, the opportunities, they're just not the, the avenues to learn the way there were even before I was there, much less when I was there, of you know, where are the used bookstores with the 25 cent bins out in front? Um, where can you go and scout up uh, a dozen books for a couple of bucks a piece and maybe find one in there that you can sell for 50 bucks, which yeah. I used to do all the time. Yeah. And you, so you, just can't, you just can't do yeah. that kind of yeah. thing anymore, yeah. can you? Well, thanks a lot, Len. I appreciate your 30 minutes with us, and uh, thanks. I enjoyed it. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for the project. Okay, great.